Welcome to Canada Files. I'm Valerie Pringle. My guest today is Margaret McMillan. She's an emeritus professor of history at the University of Toronto and at Oxford University. Her books, including bestsellers Paris 1919, Nixon in China, and most recently, War, How Conflict Shaped Us, have been translated into 26 languages. She tries to make history interesting, accessible, humane, and relevant, and she succeeds brilliantly. Welcome, Margaret. Thank you. As someone who, I guess like most of us, has grown up in this unprecedented time of peace and prosperity, what were the most important lessons you learned from this intensive study that you did of war? One of the things I learned, I think, which has stuck with me, is that we can never assume war has gone away, that it's always lurking around somewhere. And I think we're realizing that with Ukraine. I mean, who would have thought there'd be another major war in Europe uh, in the 21st century? And so I think that is something. Um, there's, a, there's something that Trotsky, the great Russian revolutionary, said, which always sticks with me, and that is, you may not be interested in war, but war is interested in you. Well, I think people sometimes think that it, we're hardwired for it. It's in our nature. We, we know we've had peaceful times, but you know, it's just something you know, that is part of who we are. I don't like to think that because that means we're condemned always to fight each other and I think the evidence is still really mixed on that. I mean, yes, we are creatures, we have a biology, we've inherited certain characteristics down through the process of evolution, but I don't think that means we've we are determined to fight because we have other characteristics. We know we can be altruistic, we can be kind to each other, we can be unselfish with each other. What I think makes people fight is much more a question of culture. I mean, war is highly organized. War is not just a brawl outside a bar. You know, war is not just two people trying to punch each other. War, when you think of the organization, the planning, the training that it takes to create war, I think it's culture. It's culture, it's discipline, it's what the societies expect of people that, that make war possible. But as you, you know, when you, when you wrote war, I mean, you examined this, you know, from so many different angles, you know, you think, what a curious, waste, really, mostly, of human life, effort, energy. Well, and it's also so reckless, because the one thing we know for sure about war is when you start it, you never know how it's going to go, and you don't know how you're going to end it. I mean, so often people start wars without really thinking about what will happen if they, if they don't win the victories they want to win, or how they end it if they do win the victories. And I do think um, it is a terrible waste. Um, unfortunately, I think there are very strong motives that push at individuals, countries, groups of people to fight each other. One is greed. You have something I want. You don't want to give it up, so I'm going to fight you for it if, if that's the way that, that I'm programmed or if that's the way I've, I've come to think. Um, sometimes you fight out of fear because you're afraid if you don't attack first, someone else is going to attack you. And sometimes it's ideology. We know how powerful ideas can be. And so people will fight to build a better world. They'll fight for religion. They'll fight for nationalism. All of those things we're seeing in the world today. Well, and you've said that ideology is, is the scariest motive. I think it is, because when you're fighting on ideological grounds, those standing in the way are wrong. They're wicked. I mean, if you're fighting to establish Christian rule on earth, you're fighting to establish Muslim rule or Hindu rule, um, anyone who resists you is by nature evil because they're resisting the, the, the promised land. And I suppose it's the same with nationalism. Anyone who resists you is somehow deeply wicked, and so they should be removed. I think ideological wars can be the cruelest of all. Mm -hmm. When you look at the situation, and as, we, as we're talking now, the situation in Ukraine is still dire. I mean, you look at someone like Putin and you go, well, what do you do about that? You want to avoid war at all costs, but how do you deal with someone who behaves that way, as, as Hitler did? It's the old age dilemma, isn't it? I mean, we can hate war as much as we like. We can say we don't want to have war. But what do you do when you have someone who is determined to use war as a weapon? And Hitler was prepared to use war as an instrument of state. And Putin is clearly was prepared to do the same, even though the instrument is now turning um, in his hand not to be as effective as he thought it would be. And you can't reason with them. You can't say to them, please don't fight, because they're not going to listen to you. I mean, I admire the pacifists like Gandhi and, and Tolstoy, who believed you should never fight under any circumstances, but I don't see how we can do it. I couldn't do it. If I see someone attacking my family, my friends, my reaction would be to say we have to fight back. Mm -hmm. And leadership 
obviously, you know, you've written a lot about individuals in history and their impact. In this particular case in Ukraine, these individuals, Putin and Zelensky, you know, are really interesting. I think the individuals matter enormously. You know, we understand the great forces in history. I mean, economics matters, sociology matters, geography matters, all these things matter, resources matter. But someone has to give the order. And I don't think this war would have happened without Putin. I think it is Putin's war. And Zelensky is the other, of course, key figure here. I mean, who would have thought that someone who had made his name as, as a comedian, um, he won the Ukrainian equivalent of Strictly Come Dancing, you know, he was charming, <laughs> but you wouldn't think of him as a statesman. And somehow he's been the man for the occasion. I think he's managed to inspire the Ukrainians. He's, he's a master at talking to them and, and talking to the world. It does feel like a turbulent times you know, in this world. You've talked about, you know, fault lines when great powers are sort of failing and rising being particularly fraught. And people look at the situation, particularly with America and China. Well, there is always, I think, you know, there's always movement in international relations. I mean, countries don't stay at the same level of power forever. They, they rise, they fall, but they don't always fall continuously. I mean, sometimes they'll rise again. The United States has gone through periods where it hasn't been all that important in the world, and then it has rebuilt itself. Same thing with Germany. Um, you know, Germany was completely um, flattened after the Second World War, and now it's much more of a power. So, you know, there's always shifting in the international order. I think what's worrying is when those powers that are pushing up feel that they're not getting their, their due place in the sun, an old expression that Germany used before the First World War, and those powers that feel threatened, um, both both moods are dangerous because the rising powers may be tempted to strike out and the declining powers may be tempted to strike out while they still can. What worries me about the present situation is it's not just the tension between the United States and China, it's too many things happening at once. You know, there are all these overlapping crises. There's the war in Ukraine, um, there's still the worry of more pandemics, the, the tensions between other countries in, in the world. And of course, overall, we have climate change. Well, that was what I was gonna bring up next, which is, you know, that it will inevitably lead to a conflict potentially over resources. I think we're already seeing it in parts of Africa, for example. Um, there's very serious potential now of conflict between Ethiopia, which controls the upper waters of the Nile, and Egypt and Sudan, which depend on those waters. And Ethiopia is building a massive dam, and there are already sort of warning signs or warnings coming from Egypt that it can't allow Ethiopia to control these waters. So I know, I think we're going to see a lot of fighting over resources. When you've talked about this book, which I guess you have now for a couple of years, yeah. you know, to many people in many venues, I mean, do, do people heed the warnings, take them seriously? Because you, you present this, I mean, it looks like, oh no, I mean, it's... I think they may take them more seriously, not because of me um, now, but because of the war in Ukraine. Um, you know, I think, look, we are extremely fortunate. I mean, in this country, I mean, you and I grew up in a country that was at peace. Yes, we were involved in wars overseas, but most of us weren't touched by war in the way that our parents and our grandparents were touched by war. And I think we got used to the idea that peace was, was just gonna continue and that war would never come close to us. And I think we're now realizing that it is coming a bit, a bit closer and the possibility of war is there. Um, the fact that it happened in Ukraine, I think, is, is really shaking people. I love the story of you growing up, which you did in Toronto. Um, with a family and no television. Yeah. <laughs> your, your parents wouldn't let you have television until all of you could read. Yeah. And I was the oldest, and my youngest brother was 10 years younger, and he just wouldn't read. He was very slow to read, and so I think it wasn't until I was 21 that we had a television in the house. So I missed all those cultural references. When people say, leave it to Beaver, I haven't got a clue what they're talking about. <laughs> well, but it, did it do something, do you think, to your brain and how you thought? And Well, we read a lot. Um, we had to read a lot, um, and my parents, you know, didn't believe in, in organizing all sorts of activities for us. They basically told us to go outside and play, which we did, but we also read, I think, and they were very good. They told us stories, um, so I think I learned a lot from their stories. My, my, my dad was in the Canadian Navy in the Second World War, and so he told us stories, usually funny ones, not the, not the really terrifying bits, um, and my mother had got caught here by the war in 1939, so we heard about that. My, both my grandfathers were in the First World War, so we heard stories. So I think we, I grew up in a household that, that was, we, we talked a lot to each other um, and we read a lot. I think I was very lucky. And a great grandfather who was a British Prime Minister who really didn't figure largely in the family lore. 
Well, he did when I went to the UK, because there his name meant something. In Canada, most people had forgotten about him. He was Prime Minister of Britain during and after the end of the First World War. Lloyd George. Lloyd George. Um, although once someone at Ryerson, a student at Ryerson, said to one of my colleagues, I had no idea Professor Macmillan was related to Boy George. <laughs> Oh, well, yeah. to Ryerson, which it was then called Ryerson, you taught 25 years of history to what would be called sort of more vocationally oriented yeah. students. I was probably one of them, journalists, nurses, engineers. And, and you found that, you know, was critical to how you think about history, how you communicate history. Yeah, I didn't realize it at the time, but it was actually great preparation for, for being a writer of history because students had to take so many liberal arts subjects. So they'd come in, some liked history, but some would come in reluctantly because it was the only course that fitted their timetable. And so it was a challenge. And I learned to tell the stories. I learned to get them in interested. I mean, I, I would tell them, well, in the case, I, would, I ended up teaching a course on war and society. And so in the case of the First World War, I'd say to the men in the class, you would have all gone off to fight and half of you would have been dead by Christmas. And I'd say to the young women in the class, you would have had to do jobs that men had been doing and a lot of you would never get married because so many men were killed. And it would sort of, I think, catch their attention because they could relate it to their own lives. And I think it was invaluable. I, I actually dedicated one of my books to my students because they made me, as best I could, explain history clearly and, and try and make it comprehensible to people who maybe weren't, weren't interested in history. You spent, was it 20 years working on your book, Paris 1919? It must have been about that. I got interested through my teaching, actually, and I was always interested in the history of the 20th century. And I looked for books on it. And to my amazement, there were books on bits of it, but not very good histories of the whole thing. And I thought, well, maybe I'll try. And so I did, for 20 years, work away on it. And I was perfectly happy. And no one was much interested in publishing it at first. So well, wasn't there one great rejection, which was basically, no one's interested in reading about a bunch of old white men sitting around a table? Yep, yep, yep. And I said, well, actually, they were talking about quite interesting things. But no, I think I just worked away on it because I was so interested. I was lucky. I, I was really, really interested in it. Well, and all the personalities, the fact that, you know, Ho Chi Minh was working <laughs> in as the a, hotel. Or... He was working in the Ritz as a sort of assistant. And he tried to present a petition about his little country, which later on became Vietnam, saying, could we please have, you know, more independence? I don't think the petition ever reached anyone. And he went off and became the great revolutionary leader who led Vietnam to independence. But you must have been stunned. I mean, when this finally got published, it was a huge success. Huge! Oh, no, no. Well, I was stunned. <laughs> I was stunned. And I think my publishers may have been a bit. Um, I think it was partly timing because it was the end of the 1990s and that sort of period of peace at the end of the Cold War was now fraying. Yugoslavia had fallen to pieces. There was all sorts of trouble in the Middle East. Um, then September the 11th, I, my book came out um, actually just around the time of September the 11th in the UK, but not in the US. But suddenly in the US as well, people were saying, how do we get here? You know, what are all these causes that people are talking about? How far back does this go? And my book, I think, was quite helpful in explaining where some of these issues had come from. Um, you know, why was this, there was hostility in certain parts of, of the Muslim world against the West? Um, why did Arabs feel they'd been betrayed? Why did Yugoslavia break up? And so I think, because I've had letters from people saying I was trying to make sense of the world we're in and, and your book was quite helpful in showing where the roots are. How did you pick after Paris 1919 to write about Richard Nixon and Nixon in China? It was partly um, tactical. And because I taught everything, I taught Chinese history for years as well. And I taught the history of the Cold War. And so I thought I'm actually sort of, I've got the background here. And I've always been interested in people in history, so that's why I did it. To look at, at the particular impact that those two individuals had at that time as well, Mao and, and Nixon. Yeah, and they were extraordinary individuals in their own way. I mean, Mao was, was a dreadful man in many ways. He was a great revolutionary leader who killed more of his own people than anyone else did. And Nixon was this very complicated character who, who was driven from office in disgrace. disgrace but they were determining the policies of their countries. And, and Nixon, for all his faults, was a great statesman. And Mao was, was, was no fool either. And Mao recognized the time had come to move China out of its isolation. And so it was a very important moment, I think. And what relevance today? Well, as the relationship between China and the United States gets rockier, I think um, we have to think about how far the relationship has come. But we have to also remember that before 1962, when Nixon went to China, they hadn't spoken to each other. 
for really almost uh, 20 years, more than 20 years, the relations had broken off in 1949. And so I think we have to remember that they could go into the deep freeze again. Yeah, I'm trying to imagine what your office must look like. <laughs> you know, books, you know, quotes, you know, so much. It's not very tidy. I'm sorry. Every so often I have a great moment where I try and tidy it up and then I find something that I haven't read before so I start reading that and then the piles go up again. But it's interesting the number of editorials that you write, that you're called upon to talk about COVID, for example, and what's the relevance of Spanish flu and what can we learn, you know, as you've mentioned in Ukraine and so many situations the world's in now that you put in context. Well, I'm glad we historians have been called upon because I think we can be useful. I mean, nothing ever repeats itself in history, but what we can do is say, look, there was a similar situation in the past. We should watch out for the following things or we should try and do the, the following things. It, it helps us to try and make sense of the present. It's not going to give us, you know, a blueprint for what to do, but it, hel it helps us test our theories too. I mean, it's, the only, it's the only way we have of testing ideas we might have. Did these ideas work in the past? Well, you say history doesn't repeat itself Ever? It, well, as Mark Twain famously said, it echoes. And so you won't get an exact repetition, but you'll get really uncomfortable parallels. I mean, you know, there are times when I look at what's happening with Ukraine, I think it's like the late 1930s in Europe, um, where you have an aggressive nation which seems to know no bounds to its aggression and, and a leader who seems prepared to, to go all the way into all out war. And so, yes, it, it, it echoes in very worrying ways. Well, and you wrote a book called The Uses and Abuses of History, and I, you know, again to, to Ukraine, Putin's use of history and his assertion that, you know, which has been used before, this is, this is our land. I mean, yeah. Well, and that's why I think knowing history is important, to be able to challenge his views. I mean, his history is wrong. Um, you know, he, he, I've read the essay, the famous essay he wrote two, two years ago called, um, it, it's about the Ukrainians and, and Russians are one people, uh, one spiritual people, and it's wrong. Um, you know, it's, it's not a good essay, but I think he believes it. And he has this vision of the past, you know, that, that Russia, the, the state that became Russia grew out of Kyiv. And one of the ironies, he's, he's now trying to destroy Kyiv, um, which he claims is the birthplace of the Russian people. And he has this view that the Ukrainians have always been sort of Russian, and, and so the attempt to become in, separate is, is a betrayal of the Russian race. He also, I think, refers a lot to Peter the Great. You know, he has a view of history. He wants to rebuild the Russian greatness as he sees it, that, that it enjoyed under Peter the Great. And his vision is wrong, but it's a very powerful vision. And I think um, my, my sense is that he actually believes in it. Mm -hmm. we, one of the things that you said, you know, it's about remembering the past, but it's also about what we choose to forget. Yeah. So I guess there's some convenient forgetting. Well, yes, because you see the conflicts that go on and on. I mean, the conflict in Northern Ireland, where the Protestants and Catholics were remembering things that had happened in the 17th century. And you think, you know, I, I did think when, you know, when, they, when all those marches took place, can you stop commemorating things that happened 300 years ago and think about actually living together in what is a very small part of the British Isles? You know, history can be used to drive communities apart, and it often is. Yeah, absolutely. We, you know, the, the closing line in that book, The Uses and Abuses of History, is, you know, hand, handle it with care. Yeah. It's a very dangerous force. You know, when people say it's all in the past, it doesn't matter. It can be used, or the misuse of history can be used to motivate people. I mean, that's what Putin is, has been trying to do. Um, that's what Xi Jinping is now trying to do. He's portraying a China that was great and he's restoring China's greatness. And it can be a very powerful force. It helps to create identity and it can often help to create enemies too. Well, that being great again thing is, is endlessly, I guess, appealing and used over and over again by leaders. Yeah, look at Trump, make America great again. Um, you know, he sells lots of caps with the slogan on it. Um, so yeah, it is, it is, it is. But what is this idea that we were once great, we aren't, we should be, we it, ought to be? It can be very powerful. There can be a sort of nostalgia for the past. I think particularly if your present is troubled. I mean, I think in Britain, um, during the whole Brexit campaign, I was there for a lot of it, the referendum campaign, there was a lot of nostalgia. Um, we were once a, a proud, independent European power. We stood alone in 1940, which, uh, you know, when, when the, the Nazis had conquered France and Britain was fighting, but not alone. I mean, as a Canadian, it infuriated me because I said, <laughs> you weren't alone. You had the whole empire. 
you know, there were four Canadian divisions in the British Isles. The Canadian Navy was patrolling half the Atlantic. The Australians were there. The Indians were in the Middle East. Um, you know, Canadian pilots were flying in the, in the Royal Air Force. You know, but this was a very powerful sentiment during the, the, bre the campaign for the referendum. And a lot of those who voted for leave, I think, were motivated by it. Debate seems to continue even more now about who tells history. I mean, I was just at an exhibit at the Royal Ontario Museum by the Indigenous artist Kent Monkman, looking at their Indigenous collection with totally different eyes. Yeah, I mean, look, history is always changing. And we try, I think, as much as we can as historians to bring in different voices and to ask different questions. You know, when I was a student at the University of Toronto, there was no women's history. It just wasn't a subject. And it became a subject, I think, partly because there was a growing women's movement in the 19, late 1960s and 1970s, and women's history became something we did. And there was no indigenous history, or very little indigenous history being done. But two of the people I went to university with um, began to, to research and, and, and began to write indigenous history. So we're always adding to the story. And I'm very glad that we're now paying much more attention to indigenous history. We're paying much more attention to the history of other minorities in Canada as well, much more attention to immigrant histories, much, there's much more attention to um, gay history. I mean, all these things are part of what makes the country the country it is, and we need to, st we need to know about them. What's the point of museums, do you think? Oh, it's a very hotly debated subject, as I don't need to tell you. Um, are they a symbol of, of Western imperialism, simply collecting things from around the world to show, you know, to show Westerners or all these other cultures? Or are they in some way a, a, a sharing of, of, a, of, of a, the, the, a commemoration of a shared heritage? And I don't know. I mean, there's a debate, I think a very interesting debate going on now about what museums are. Um, I was just at the British Museum for something and, and the, the chair of their board said, you know, we want to be a museum for the world and we want to try and bring the different cultures together and, and help people to understand them. But, you know, what do you send back? What do you keep? Who owns it? These, these are all very, very difficult questions. One of the things that, that people have been dealing with a great deal lately too are apologies, official apologies, government apologies. Are apologies necessary? Are they, are they helpful? It depends, I think, on the circumstances. I think it was necessary that the Canadian government made an apology to the Indigenous um, for some of the things that happened to them, including, of course, the, the residential schools. It was necessary that the Prime Minister of Australia made an apology to the Aboriginal people of Australia, who the Aborigines who, who'd been, in many cases, very badly treated by settler society. I think an apology is only a first step. And what I worry about is polo apologies are becoming performative. I do an apology, and then what else do I do? You know, apologies are only, it seems to me, useful if they're backed up by determination to right the wrongs of the past, to do something for the people living in the present. But words are cheap. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes there's, there's a, a passion for apologizing, um, and then you don't do anything else. It's very easy, and I think we all slip into it judging, you know, previous societies, earlier times. How could they think that? How could they do that? You know? No. I always think 50 years from now, I won't be around, but someone will be saying, how could those people in 2022 or 2010, how could they think that? And, you know, we should have a, I mean, if history does nothing else, it should give us a little bit of humility. And the past is full of people who had all sorts of insights and were very clever and had all sorts of power and all sorts of sources of knowledge, and they still did things that we think now are wrong or very stupid. So we should just remember that someone's going to be doing it to us. For sure, they'll be doing it for to us. Um, so, looking back at this illustrious career, what what is it you you're most proud of? Um, I think what I like particularly is when people come up to me and say, "I read your book and I, I enjoyed it." And I don't read much, um, but I really enjoyed it because I like the people, um, and I think I learned something. I mean, that's what I've always been a teacher, and that sounds very pious, but I do like it when people get interested in, in, in something, and, and I hope they'll want to know more. What does uh, being Canadian mean to you? Oh, look, I'm very proud of being a Canadian. I grew up here. It's my country. Um, doesn't mean sometimes I don't get fed up with its politics or you know, whatever. We all do with our own countries. But I think I live in a very decent and humane society. I mean, we beat ourselves up, I think. But you know, I think we are probably one of the nicest and, and kindest societies in the world. Doesn't mean we don't make mistakes. 
but you know, when, whenever you ask people around the world what they think of Canada, we rank very high up. I mean, you know, they, they see us as, and I think they're right, a decent society that has made mistakes but wants to do good. Um, what I also find as an historian being very helpful to be Canadian is I don't have access to grind. Um, you know, I don't come from a great power, so I don't feel that I have to either attack or defend my own country. Whereas I think if you're American or British or, or Russian, you, if you're writing about the history of your own country, you, you, you almost can't avoid taking a position. I think being Canadian gives me a certain, certain freedom writing about other powers in the world. Well, it's been a total pleasure to speak with you. Well, it's been a great pleasure for me too. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, thank you all for watching and we'll be back next week with another episode of Canada Files. The preceding program was made possible through the generous support of Bryce and Nikki Douglas, as well as the following donors, Ted and Alice Kernahan, the Browning Watt Foundation, Mary Davy, David and Cheryl Carr, Jim and Sandra Pitbledu, Tony and Sherry Fell, Richard Wernham and Julia West, Charles and Marilyn Bailey, Michael McCain and family, Richard Pelosoff, Clench House Foundation, Kathy and George Dombrowski, the 63 Foundation, and by the Central Canadian Public Television Association.